Good morning and welcome to our worship live stream. Hey, thanks for joining us and we really hope that the message today encourages you and your walk with Jesus. Would you take just a moment and share this stream with someone? You can invite a friend or a family member to watch along with you. Um, hey, if you're joining us today for the first time, would you please let us know? You can reach out to our connection team by texting the word welcome to the number that's appearing on the screen. Uh, we look forward to talking with you and we hope to meet you really soon. Today, we want to give you an update on our steps to regathering plan. For the last few months, we've been on step three of our plan, which has included two indoor worship services and one outdoor worship service in the Grove. Additionally, life groups have resumed meeting on campus and we resumed a modified schedule for kids and preschoolers. I'm happy to announce that we're finalizing plans for step four that will begin on October the 4th. Step four will include the following. We're going to move the 930 worship service from outdoors in the Grove to indoors in building one. Now for worshipers who still prefer outdoor seating, the 930 hour will include an outdoor seating area on the patio that's just outside of building one. Step four will also include activities for uh, kids and preschoolers at both the 9.30 hour and the 11 o'clock hour, as well as life group activities for students and adults. Each week, we're going to continue to provide you updates and important details as you make plans for how and when you and your family will gather for worship, for kids' activities, and for life groups. And by the way, the worship live stream will continue at both 9.30 and 11 for those who are not yet comfortable still uh, being on campus. We want to say thank you for your patience as we have navigated this season in the life of our church family, and we're looking forward to the great days ahead as we gather together. As you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send these to us by email or contact us by phone at the church office, and we'll be happy to assist you with whatever it is that you need to know. Church, one of the ways that we worship is through giving, and we'd love to have you be a part of the team. In just a moment, we'll show several ways that you can participate in helping to fund the ministry efforts here at First Daytona. You can give online or by text, or you can give in the Church Center app as well. And as always, you can mail a gift to the church or drop it off at the office during the week. Our staff is back in the office every day, and we'd love to see you if you come by. We want to thank you for being so faithful in your giving to the ministry at First Daytona. And uh, let's, so let's pray together, and uh, we'll prepare our hearts for worship. Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for your goodness. We want to celebrate today your grace. We have experienced your faithfulness in so many ways over the last months. And we are grateful that you have brought us to a place where we can take another step towards regathering uh, our church together. Thank you for a family that you've given us to be a part of. Thank you for brothers and sisters in Christ. And as we gather together this morning, even though we're meeting in different places, our hearts are knit together because of the gospel. And we just want to celebrate that today. And so we just ask that as we hear your word taught and as we sing to you, as we, as we pray together, that you would help us to draw near to you and that we might grow deeper in our faith and our understanding of who we are and who we are in you. And uh, we just thank you again for your goodness. And we pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist. We pray that you're having a great morning so far and that you're worshiping our God. We ask that you would sing along with us. You know what? What was meant for an implement of torture, the cross, the cruel cross that they hung Jesus on, turned out to be our salvation. We don't understand it, but we're grateful for it. It was a glorious day. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb 
Till I met you I was breathing But not Alive All my failures I tried To hide It was my doom Till I met you you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the to your glorious day. We're grateful for the mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that saved our soul. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old man knew Jesus, when I met you, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious name. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy. But chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you are my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my name, I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Aren't you grateful that we do not have to live in the darkness of sin any longer, but we can walk in the light that is ours because of the finished work of our Savior on the cross. Amen and amen. You know, as we surrender our will to His will, we run to the place where our help can be found. It's running into the open arms of the Father, the Father who is always there, who never leaves us, who never forsakes us. He's the one who has never left our side. I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go I see it now I'm laying it down and I know that I need you I run to the Father I fall into grace I'm done with the hiding no reason to wait my heart needs a surgeon my 
my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Context for that kind of love, I don't understand, I can't comprehend. All I know is I need you. I run to the Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon. Soul needs a friend, so I run to the Father again and again and again and again. call us to yourself in salvation, but then you don't leave us alone. But you walk through this life with us each and every step of the way. We know that we can depend on you in the good times and in the bad times. We relinquish our will and we look to you for your will and your way. Father, we love you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Revelation chapter 22. The last chapter of the Bible. I mean, this is the finish. I mean, we've kind of worked our way through the book of Revelation and knowing that Revelation is the unveiling, the uncovering of who Jesus is. As a matter of fact, sometimes we can get in Revelation and we can kind of get get kind of bogged down trying to make sure that we figure out all the little things about it. But Revelation, the unveiling, the uncovering of Jesus Christ. But may I ask you a question about Revelation? How has studying the book of Revelations changed your perspective? When we study the Revelation as John is on the island of Patmos and God gives John this incredible word, we know it's uh, after 90 AD, we know it's been 60 years after the ascension of Jesus back in the heaven. And here is John, the the, the apostle that was so close to Jesus. 
You might ask, how close was John to Jesus? I mean, Jesus gave John the responsibility to take care of Mary. How close is John that John was so close to Jesus that the Scripture tells us that Jesus even laid upon the chest of Jesus. How close is John to Jesus that you got that inner circle, Peter, James, and John? How close is John to Jesus? He is close. And God is bringing this revelation to him in such a beautiful way. But how does revelations change your perspective? How does it change your perspective that in Revelation chapter 1 verse 19, that the scripture says, and Jesus Christ that he holds the keys to Hades and death. How does that change how you live today? How does it change your perspective in Revelation chapter 1, the description of Jesus? It talks about his hair and the purity of Jesus. How does it change your perspective in Revelation chapter 1? It says that his eyes are like a flame of fire, that his eyes can see through everything. How does it change your perspective today that Jesus can see all things? Nothing is hidden from Jesus. How does it change your perspective today in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, where we see the seven churches of Revelation, seven real and alive churches, as John is writing this? And he's writing these churches and saying, hey, let me give you a characteristic of Jesus. Let me tell you that where Jesus says, and I know your works. I know what you're doing. How does it change your perspective that Jesus knows all your works this last week and what you did. How does it change your perspective of these seven churches and where he says, over he who overcomes, 1 John chapter 5 tells us, all of us that are in Jesus. Man, if you're not in Jesus, the scripture says today is the day of salvation. If you have not trusted Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, hey, you need to trust him today. But if you have trusted Jesus Christ in your life, 1 John chapter 5 tells us that we are an overcomer. Well, it tells us in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 for the seven churches, I know your works and he who overcomes. How does it change your perspective when you study Revelation chapter 4 and we get a picture of the throne room of God? You know, most of us like to go look at houses and kind of see, you know, what's the latest uh, cabinet somebody puts in their house? What's the light fixtures look like? Well, in Revelation chapter 4, you get to step into the throne room of God. And you know what they say in the throne room of God? It says in the 24 elders representing the, the 12 tribes of Israel, representing the 12 apostles representing all of us as saints of God. It says around the throne room of God, they're crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. How does that change your perspective that around the throne room of God, holy, 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 how does it change your perspective in Revelation chapter 5 that it says that God in his right hand holds the scroll. And it says that it's completely written on the inside and out that is completely complete. And on that scroll, that scroll is the title deed to earth. And on that title deed to earth, there are seven seals on that title deed. And how does it change your perspective when it says, who in the world is worthy to open up the scroll? How does it change your perspective? And it says, and Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the one that John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus Christ, said, looked and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Here is the Lamb of God that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is worthy to open up the scroll. What does it do for your perspective from Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, all the way to Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, when we see the seven-year tribulation, the great tribulation. The great tribulation where the seven seals are going to be opened up, the seven trumpet judgments, the seven vile judgments, even the woe are these vile judgments as they're being 
poured out. How does that change your perspective? How does it change your perspective that in Revelation chapter 19, the second coming of Christ, that we're going to be coming back with Christ to rule and the reign for a thousand years? How does it change your perspective that it tells us that the unholy trinity, Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, how does it change your perspective knowing that the unholy trinity is going to be thrown in the lake of fire forevermore? How does it change our perspective in Revelation chapter 20 that when every single person who's not trusted the Lord and they stand before God and the book is open and if your name is not in the book, then the books will be open and the books have the record of your life and everything that you've done and you'll be judged according to what the book said and they will receive their final punishment forever. How does that change your perspective? How does it change your perspective in Revelation chapter 21 that he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth? That there's going to be no more tears, no more pain, no more hurt. How does it change your perspective that we're going to be able to witness as Christ follower as a new city of Jerusalem it comes down out of heaven? How does it change your perspective? Well, I hope Revelation changes our perspective because these words, they are faithful and they are true. It should change our perspective that we're going to one day be able to walk inside the new Jerusalem. Can we talk about that new Jerusalem? I'm writing this down. Number one, the new Jerusalem. Write down three words, a river, a tree, and a face. Look at Revelation chapter 22 and look at these first five verses. This is the final glimpse that we're going to get into this, the new city of Jerusalem. And it should change how we live today. Look what it says, Revelation 22, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river. Mark that word, river. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Can we talk about the river of God? It says in the new city of Jerusalem, there's going to be a river. But we've got to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. What does it tell us in the Garden of Eden? What does it tell us about in the Garden of Eden? It tells us in Revelation chapter, I mean Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, that in the Garden of Eden that there was a river, and that river even went off into four tributaries. Well, can I tell you? In this new city, there's going to be a river. And notice what it says about this river. And the river he showed me a what? Pure river. Right next to pure put no pollution, no sin. What is that saying? That he's going to take us to a pure river. That means that there is no curse in this river. That means like the scripture tells us, remember when Jesus met the woman at the well, the lady that was there in the middle of the day, and really she was a complete outcast, and Jesus broke every cultural barrier imaginable as Jesus is there with that lady at the woman at the well. And remember Jesus said, I I I'm going to offer you living water, everlasting water, Water that you will never thirst ever again. Can I tell you, when we think about a river, a pure river, it shows of the, the salvation of God. When we think about the river of God, it shows the prosperity. As a matter of fact, even in Psalms, it tells us about this river. But this river is going to be pure. Why? Wow, look what it says in Revelation 22, verse 3. And I really want you to mark this. This is foundational for us. And there shall be no more what? Curse. Why should there be no more curse? What do you mean about curse, Pastor Eric? Well, you've got to go back all the way to Genesis chapter 3. And Genesis chapter 3 is the fall of man. That God created everything perfect. Everything was right. 
But remember, God told Adam and Eve, whatever you do, do not eat off the tree. Don't eat off of this one tree, the knowledge of wisdom. Don't eat of this tree. What did they do? Adam and Eve, they ate upon that tree. And the moment they ate upon that tree, sin entered the world. The moment they ate upon that tree, they immediately spiritually died. The moment they ate of that tree, they began the process of physically dying. It was God's grace and God's goodness that the moment they ate of that tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, it was God's grace that he did not just, they did not physically die instantly. They died spiritually instantly. They died gradually physically. But because they did that, there was a curse. As a matter of fact, you read in, in Genesis chapter 3, that we see the curse against Satan. The curse against Satan, it is says in Genesis chapter 3, that, hey, Satan, you are going to crawl on your bare belly and you're going to eat of the dust. That's the curse for Satan. What's the curse of a lady? Well, it tells us in Genesis chapter 3, it says the curse of a lady is that, hey, ladies, when you have a child, it what? It hurts. Why? Because of what happened. And it also said the curse of a lady, it says that you're going to have a desire for your husband. What is that saying? That you're going to want to be over your husband. The curse for man, that you're going to go have to work the ground. You've got to go work the ground, and there's going to be thistles and thorns, and you've got to work that ground. But what does it tell us in Revelation chapter 22, verse 1? But there's going to be no curse, and the river is going to be pure, because Revelation 22, verse 3, and there shall be no more curse. Right next to that, there shall be no more curse. You need to write down Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, why shall there be no more curse? Because it tells us in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, that Jesus Christ took that curse for us. What is that saying? That when Jesus was on the cross, he took the curse of all of your sin and all of your stuff, and that curse came on him. So number one about this city, a river. Look at the second thing about this city in verse number two. In the middle of the street and on either side of the river. Let's go back and look at that again in verse two. In the middle of the what? Street. Is that street plural or singular? It's singular. Remember, we all live on Main Street. In the middle of the street and on either side of the river was the tree of life. Mark that word, tree of life. Most of the time when we look at the Scripture, we think about the tree, think about a tree that Jesus Christ was crucified on. When we think about the tree, we think about the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, but we forget about the tree of life. What I want you to do, keep your finger here, and let's travel all the way to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 2, and I want you to see this tree of life is talked about in Genesis chapter 2. Look what it says in Genesis 2 verse 9. So I want you to see in Revelation chapter 22 verse 2, it's not that all of a sudden the tree appears in verse number 2. I want you to see this tree of life appears that we see in Genesis chapter 2 verse 9. Look what it says, and out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and the good for food. Look at this, Martin, this. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Most of the time people just think of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But in the garden was a tree of life. But after Adam and Eve sinned, God did not want them to get to the tree of life. If they ate in their sinful condition, if they ate upon the tree of life in their sinful condition, they would have been doomed for 
forever, and they would have been in sin forever. They, they would have been doomed for that sin of life forever. So what does God do? Look at Revel, I mean Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. What does Jesus do with the tree of life? Because he said, I don't want you to eat of the tree of life, but you'll be doomed in that state forever. So look what happens. So he, it, Genesis 3, 24. So he drove out the man, and he placed the cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword was turned every way to guard the way to what? The tree of life. Why is God guarding the way to the tree of life? Because he did not want them to eat of the tree of life. But what does it tell us? Look at Revelation chapter 22, verse 2. What does it say that's going to be next to the side of the river? It says, and the tree of life. Listen when it says, which bore 12 fruits, and each tree yields its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Can I tell you, in this city, we're going to be able to eat of the tree of life. We got a river, verse 1. Verse 2, we have a tree. Verse 3, it tells us there's no more curse. Verse 4, it's going to tell us that we are going to serve forever more. I mean, verse 3, at the end of verse 3, it says, and his servant shall serve him. What are we going to be doing in this city? We're going to be serving God forevermore. Some people think in heaven or we're just going to be floating around doing whatever. We're going to be lazy. No, you know what we're going to be doing? We're going to be serving the Lord. Why? Because there's a river, there's a tree. But verse 4, I want you to put a star by this. This is profound to me. And to me, this is one of the most beautiful things. It should change our perspective today when we read Revelation 22, verse 4. You know, as a kid growing up, as a kid growing up, um, we had dinner about every, the same time every night. About 5.15 or so, man, we'd have dinner as a family. And I knew just right before that, my dad was going to walk in the door. You know, those days that, man, when everything was right and I was doing what was right, man, I love seeing the face of my daddy. My daddy is coming home. I can't wait to see my daddy. But there's other days where I didn't do something right. I messed up. And there's some days that my mom and I have to say, wait till your daddy gets home. On those days when my mom would look and say, wait till your daddy gets home. Home. It's kind of like that finger, you know, just points and it just comes right at you. Because you knew you're about to see the face of your dad when your dad gets home and he's going to do with his stuff. Can I tell you, Revelation 22 verse 4 says, it should change our perspective today because guess what? Christ followers, look what it says. Verse 4, and they shall see his what? Face. Boys, we take a step into this place. The river's great, the tree of life. We're going to get to serve the Lord. When I think about, it, I want to see His face. You know, I, I, I'm a person that I, I love to hug you, put my arms around you. You know, even as a dad, one of the sweetest things, isn't it, when your kids come and put their hands on your face? I'm waiting for this moment. I'm waiting for this moment when I'm going to get to see the face of Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to this moment when I, I, I get to see my Jesus who took the nails in his hands and his feet for me. I, I'm looking for that day that I get to see his face. And what does it tell us about us? It says that we're marked. How are we marked? And his name shall be on their foreheads. You know, the day when you get saved, you're marked. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit, something invisible that nobody can see, but you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God today. But it says, you're going to see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Wow, what a city. So number one, the city, a river, a tree, and a face. Second thing I want you to write down. You ready? He's coming back. Second thing right now, he's coming back. 
Be ready. Jesus Christ is coming back. You're going to see a theme. The rest of the book of Revelation, the rest of this chapter is about Jesus Christ is coming back. Look what it says in Revelation 22, verse 7. Three times it tells us, do not be surprised. He is coming back. Look what it says in Revelation 22, verse 7. Behold, I am coming, what? Quickly, blessed is he who keeps the words of this prophecy and of this book. Look what it says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. And behold, I am what? Coming quickly. Look what it says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. It says, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am what? Coming quickly. Can I tell you what? Jesus Christ is coming quickly every single morning that God gives us another day. We need to wake up expecting that God is going to interrupt our day and he's coming back. There should never be a day that we live a day in our life without the perspective of thinking, hey, it could be the next second, it could be the next moment. We shouldn't be surprised because he is coming again. The question is, what are we supposed to be doing? We're going to be in this city. He's going to quickly come back. What should we be doing? I I want you to write down these four things we should be doing as we're waiting for his coming. Look what it says again in verse 7. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who does what? Keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. We should be expecting Jesus Christ at any moment. What should we be doing right now? Write write one word. Obedience. It says here, as we are waiting for his coming, we should be keep it. We should be obedience. What is obedience? And I love what Life Action says. Obedience is doing what God says to do when he says to do it with a right heart attitude. So you know what you need to be doing today because he's going to come quickly. We know that's going to happen in Revelation 22, verse 6. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. What is faithful and true? That he is going to come back again. And because he's going to come back again, we need to be obedient today. I want you to know, this life is not a game. This life is not about your selfishness. This life is not about you. Your life no longer belongs to you. Your life belongs to God. And what do we do in this moment? We need to be obedient. May I ask you a question? Are you obedient to the things of God? He's coming quickly. We need to be obedient. Let me show you a second thing that we need to do as we're waiting for that moment. Look at verse 8 and verse 9, second word. What do we do as we're waiting for him to come? We worship God. Look what it says in verse 8 and 9. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. So here is John. He's hearing these things. He's seeing these things. And all of a sudden, he's so overwhelmed. He just falls down at the feet of the angel. Can I tell you, we're never to worship an angel. I I, I don't think it's really John's intent to do it. I think he's just overwhelmed. He's heard, he saw all of this, and he just falls down to worship. Look what the angel says to do in verse 9. Then he said to me, see that you do not do that. For I am your fellow servant, and of your brother and the prophets of those who kept the words of this book. Mark these last two words. Here we go. Worship God. You might say, Pastor Eric, what am I supposed to be doing today? Being obedient and keeping the things of God. What should I be doing today? Mark those two words at the end of verse 9. What should you be doing today? What is the purpose and the plan of your life? Worship God. That means when you came to church, when you go to church on Sunday, that means when you go to work, that means whatever you do, you need to go into every situation bringing your worship. Have you ever met that person when they come to church? I've watched them. You know, they come in church, they come sit down, they cross their arms. By golly, you just bless me if you can. You know what?
We need to come to church. Knowing that his blood has covered us. That he was cursed so we would not be cursed. We should come to church knowing that his love for us never changes. We should come to church. Ready to say, I'm ready to gather with the people of God so we can worship God. Can I tell you, even right now in your home, in your living room, what does God want? He could come right now. What does he want us to do? He wants us to be obedient and keep his promises. What does he want us to do? He wants us to worship God. But it does it in there. Look at verse number 10. What should we be doing as we're waiting for him to come quickly? Write this third thing down. We should be sharing the gospel. Sharing the but not sealed. Too many Christians are this way. Their mouths are sealed and they're not sharing. Our mouth should not be sealed. Our mouth and our heart and our character should be full of the gospel. Look what, look what the Scripture says. Revelation chapter 22, verse 10 says, And he said to me, Do not seal the words of this prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. What does he say? Hey, John, do not seal these words. He's saying, hey, don't close them up and hide them to yourself. You know what he's saying? Hey, I want you to open this up. He's saying, I don't want you to seal these words. I want you to proclaim it. I want you to teach it. I want you to go to every house, every village. I want you to go to every child, every boy, every girl, every culture, every nation, every people. People go, I don't want this to be sealed, but I want it to be shared. What are we supposed to be doing in this moment? A statistic that has broken my heart for years. And it's not changed. Where it says 90-something percent of Christians have never shared their faith or led somebody to Christ. Let me tell you, I believe, verse 7, I am coming quickly. I believe, verse 12, and behold, I am coming quickly. I believe, verse 20, and surely I am coming quickly. Whatever you do, do not seal it, but share it. What does God want us to do right now? God wants obedience. What does God want us to do? He wants worship. What does God want us to do? Don't seal it, but share it. What does God want us to do? Look at verse 12. Write this fourth thing now. What does God want us to do as we're waiting for this moment? We need to work. Look at verse 12. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his what? Work. What does God want us to do? God wants us working. You know, if God is so gracious and we get to live 70 years, you know, we're going to spend five years of our life just getting ready. We're going to spend 20 years of our life just sleeping. But let me ask you a question. And he's going to give everyone according to his word. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 is one of my favorite verses where God has created us to be his workmanship. What does God want today? That we are working for the kingdom of God. So it says he's coming again. What should we be doing? We should be obeying. We should be worshiping. We should be sharing. And we should be working. Last word. In verse 18 and 19, he gives a warning. And he's going to give a warning Whatever you do, don't add or take away. Let's read it. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy 
of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He gives us a warning. Hey, don't add to this. Don't take away that he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. Don't take away that we're going to experience the pure river. Don't don't take away that we're going to be able to experience the tree of life. Don't take away that we're going to be able to experience and that we shall see his face. Don't take away that he is going to come quickly. Don't take away that we should be obeying him today. Don't take away that we should be worshiping him today. Don't take away the day that we should be sharing the gospel. Don't take away the day that we should be working for the kingdom of God. Don't take those things away. Revelation, the unveiling of Jesus. May I ask you, on this moment, Jesus is coming. Are you ready? And there's only one way to be ready, and that is the trust in Jesus' death and resurrection, and that is to turn away from your sin and your selfishness and trust Him alone. Because we know Revelation 22, Christ followers, may I ask you, are you being obedient to the things of God? May I ask you, are you worshiping God like he wants us to? May I ask you, are you sharing the gospel? May I ask you, are you working for the things of God? If you're not, in this moment, just admit it. And say, God, I I admit, man, these things are not my heart. Maybe the day you're doing these things, can I tell you, keep living like the next second, the rapture could happen. Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you for this final word of Revelation 22. God, I thank you for the river, and that's going to be pure. Thank you, God, for the the tree of life that we're going to be able to eat upon. Thank you, Lord, that we're going to live in a place where there's no curse. Thank you, Lord, that we're going to live in a place that we can see your face. Thank you, Lord, that you tell us that you're going to come quickly. Because you're coming quickly, Lord, I pray that we're going to keep your word and we're going to be obedient because you're going to come quickly. God, I pray that we're going to worship God in our life. God, I pray because you're going to come quickly. We will not seal these things, but we're going to share these things. God, I pray because we know that you're going to come quickly. I pray that we will know one day we'll be rewarded for our work. God, I pray that we'll be working for the kingdom. And God, I pray that we'll receive this warning we will not add or we will not take away from this word. God, help us. And God, thank you that you are so deeply in love with us. Just right now in your room, your kitchen, right now, why don't you trust Jesus? Trust the love of Jesus today. Just right now, from your heart to the heart of God, say, Dear Jesus, I need you. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner and I'm messed up. But Jesus, thank you for your death. Thank you for your resurrection. And I ask you to save my soul and forgive me. Right now, the scripture says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you just repented of your sin, 
turned away from what you've done wrong and you trusted Jesus Christ, the scripture says you are now forgiven. The Holy Spirit of God has come to live inside of your life and he has sealed you. And because of that, we need to tell the whole world, if you just trusted Jesus Christ, what I want you to do, there's going to come a a number on the screen, and I want you to text the word STEP. Just text me that word STEP, that you have trusted Jesus Christ to be your Savior and your Lord. Maybe today you are a Christ follower. And you are not living like he can return at any moment. Maybe there's an obedience issue. Maybe there's a worship issue. Maybe there's a sharing issue. Maybe there's a work issue. And right now, say, dear Jesus, help me. God, I want to to keep your word. I want to follow your your commandments. I want to be obedient. Maybe you say, dear Jesus, help me. I want to worship you. I want to bring my worship to church. I want to bring my worship to my work. I want to bring worship to my family. I want to worship God. Right now, say, God, help me. Lord, I don't even know what all this looks like, but help me. Some of you, you need to pray, God, that I'll share the gospel. Some of you right now, pray for boldness and strength. For some of you say, God, I want to work for the kingdom of God. For all of us, let's heed this warning and not add or take away. Lord God, we say, I surrender all to you. Hey, on this day, I want you to know Jesus' thoughts towards you are to give you a future and a hope. Jesus' thoughts and desires for you is that you get to experience the river, the tree, and get to see his face. And knowing that, let's live different today, knowing the future that we have ahead. Hey, I want you to know, God loves you. We love you as a church. If there's any way that we can serve you, let us know. But let's go make much of Jesus this week. Hey, we want to thank you again for joining us today for worship. I want to invite you, if you have any questions, to let us know. We're here to serve you, and we would love to hear more about your next step in your journey with Jesus. You can reach us by texting the word STEP to the number on the screen, or you can use the Next Steps tab that's in the Church Center app. And we just want to thank you again for being with us for worship today.